Well, good morning. It's fantastic to be here. Thank you, Ben. That was wonderful. Um, I must just start off by saying thank you to Lee for inviting me. It's a privilege to be here again. And um, I'm sure to you, the church, uh, if, you, if this is your home church, if you've been here for a while, you know what a legend this man is. What you may not know is what a legend he is to so many pastors around uh, Joburg and around the world. Uh, every church needs a pastor, but what you don't know often is that every pastor needs a pastor. And he, he is a father to many people. So I'm so thankful to be here today. Thank you for inviting me. And thank you for your and Irene's love in Talia and my life. You've been with us for so many years now, and we so appreciate your friendship and support and encouragement. And also, I must just say before I get going, uh, yes, sorry for stealing Mike Ryan. He is uh, an absolute blessing to us. He, he is settling in so well. He is really developing the kids' ministry, the volunteers. He's already pioneering a youth ministry with us. He's doing so well. Um, and so thank you. I know it was painful uh, to let him go and to say goodbye to him, but it has been such a blessing to us. And so I'd love to also encourage you to just keep praying for him. Uh, it is a transition that he's completely changed careers, changed what he's doing, um, but he is doing so well and the Lord's hand is on him. We would appreciate for you to continue praying for him. All right, this morning we're going to be, um, if you could grab your Bibles, we're going to be looking at Mark chapter 3 from verse 7. Um, I'm not sure what version you've got in front of you. I must apologize. I'm reading from the CSB version, um, not too different from the NIV, but as you're turning there, I thought I'd just kick us off by um, just saying that I'm sure many of us have heard the phrase, hidden in plain sight. Uh, it's just a little phrase meaning when something goes unnoticed or manages to mask itself, even if it is visible and not hidden at all. And uh, I'm sure this has happened to, to many of us, when something's right in front of you, but for whatever reason, you just can't see it. Um, whether it's a set of keys that you are looking for and can't find. Um, did that happen this morning? It did. There we go. But it's right there on the table. You see, it's prophetic. I come here with uh, some insight. Or maybe it's uh, sneaking some veggies into your toddler's food and, and hoping they don't notice. Or maybe it's um, when your wife gets a haircut and walks in and, and you fail, you do the terrible thing of failing to notice, which we've never done, Haley. We, we're professionals, yeah? The point being that sometimes something can be right in front of us and we miss it. And this morning as we look at this passage, one of the key uh, emphases here is that Jesus is doing amazing things. He's healing, he's saving, he's forgiving, he's comforting, he's meeting people, and yet so many fail to recognize just who he is and what's happening right in front of their eyes. It, it's, it's amazing. They, they have the glory of God in Jesus the Son in front of them, and they can't see it. They just miss it entirely. entirely. They, they fail to recognize Jesus. And um, just this morning, my heart for us and my hope for us, including myself, it's been a beautiful time of prep in this, is that as we consider responding to Jesus and the responses to Jesus in this passage, that we would be stirred afresh this morning to give our hearts to him afresh. Say, yes, Jesus, you really are who you said you are. You have done what you said you would do, and you will do what you said you will do. A gospel is just, when we hear the gospel, we can't remain neutral. As this one theologian said, it's evidence that demands a response. And um, C.S. Lewis once helped us see that Jesus uh, is either a liar, a lunatic, a legend, or he's the Lord. And today, again, we have an opportunity to settle it afresh in our hearts and minds that he is the Lord, that he has done what he said he'll do, and that he is who he really says he is. And uh, my heart that every one of us, my heart is that every one of us would just take even one step closer towards him this morning and again surrender our lives to his majesty. So would you read with me? from Mark chapter 3, verses 7 to 21. Jesus departed with his disciples to the sea, and a large crowd followed from Galilee, and a large crowd followed from Judea, Jerusalem, Edomia, beyond the Jordan, and around Tyre and Sidon. 
The large crowd came to him because they heard about everything he was doing. Then he told his disciples to have a small boat ready for him so that the crowd wouldn't crush him. Since he had healed many, all who had diseases were pressing toward him to touch him. Whenever the unclean spirits saw him, they fell down before him and cried out, You are the Son of God. And he would strongly warn them not to make him known. Jesus went up the mountain then and summoned those he wanted, and they came to him. He appointed twelve, whom he also named apostles, to be with him, to send them out to preach and to have authority to drive out demons. He appointed the twelve, to Simon he gave the name Peter, and to James the son of Zebedee, and to his brother John he gave the name Boanerges, that is, sons of thunder, Andrew, Philip, and Bartholomew, Matthew and Thomas, James the son of Alphaeus, and Thaddeus, Simon the zealot, and Judas Iscariot, who also betrayed him. Then Jesus went home, and the crowd gathered again so that they would, were not even able to eat. But when his family heard this, they set out to restrain him because they said, he's out of his mind. Would you pray again with me briefly? Father, thank you for your word. Thank you that your word does your work. And we pray this morning as we dig into this passage and unpack it that you would open our eyes afresh to see Jesus that would you, you would open our hearts to respond, that you would come and do what only you can do in your grace. We look to you again this morning. Amen. Well, this might seem like a bit of an odd text to choose. He gave me carte blanche to, to pick whatever I felt the Lord leading me to, and I, and I did feel this passage would be helpful for us this morning. There's some gold in here for us, uh, I think I just saw here that you're going to be going through Luke, and so I'll, I'll let Lee do the expert uh, job on this in a few weeks' time, I'm sure. But this morning, my approach is going to be simply looking at the different groups of people in this passage and how they respond to Jesus. How they respond to Jesus. And my heart, again, is that we would come to, without holding any part of ourselves back, that we would take a look at the disciples and actually be encouraged by that this morning, that there is a call to come to him fully as we are without holding anything back. And so we're going to look at the crowds, the demons, Jesus' family, and the disciples finally. But firstly, let's look at the crowd, the first group uh, of people in this passage. And what I want to really uh, encourage us with here and, and help us see is that there is a lot of emotion in this crowd, but, but little devotion, uh, particularly from verse 7 to 10. The phrase large crowd is used three times to describe how many people were flocking to Jesus. We see uh, that it says they came because they heard everything Jesus was doing. They're, they're amazed, and it would seem that there were so many people flocking to Jesus that Jesus says, hey, disciples, please, would you go get me a boat so I can get out on the water, I can have some space, because I feel like I'm going to get crushed here. And uh, it's amazing that so many people were rushing towards him. There was clearly a hype in the moment and an excitement about Christ and what he was doing. And uh, it may seem a bit harsh to say that there was a lot of emotion without any devotion, but in fact, uh, and I must admit, this text alone doesn't give us the full picture of the crowd's response, but if we continue on reading in Mark, and in fact, all of the Gospels, there is always a uh, included fickleness when it comes to the crowds. They are always there when the excitement things, exciting things are happening, when the miracles are happening, when the preaching is happening. They're always there, but you don't often see the crowds responding in faith. And in fact, you actually often see the crowds scattering when the heat comes and when tough things happen. There's, they're fickle. And nevertheless, they are here rushing towards Jesus, maybe They've come, it says, seeing that he is healing many people and they're coming in his need. 
uh, perhaps even there is an excitement, excitement to see this kind of celebrity figure or they've heard what an amazing preacher he is and they want to come uh, hear him preach like it's some kind of Taylor Swift concert. They're just flocking towards Jesus. There's, there's desperation, desperation, curiosity, excitement, lots of emotion. But as I said, the crowd would soon desert Jesus. There's little lasting devotion. And so it reminds me of that parable Jesus tells, actually, in the next chapter of Mark and as well as Matthew and Luke. It's the parable of the sower or of the soils. And he says that the, the gospel, the good news of the gospel, is like seed that gets scattered all over and it lands on all kinds of different soil. The, the, the God, the ultimate sower, is so generous with his spreading of the seed of the gospel, but people respond differently. And he, and he says that different uh, types of soils respond differently, some producing good fruit, some not producing any fruit at all. Um, but one kind of seed is seed that lands on rocky ground. And in Mark 4, 16 to 17, Jesus says this, and others are like seeds sown on rocky ground. When they hear the word, immediately they receive it with joy. But they have no root. They are short-lived. And when distress or persecution comes because of the word, they fall away immediately. So you see this with the Gospels again and again. There's a quick rushing to Jesus and yet they desert Jesus as quickly as they came to him. And I must confess, there is nothing more heartbreaking than this, isn't there? The joy of seeing people seemingly come to faith and we don't know what God's gonna do in their lives. We, we know that he'll lose none the Father has given uh, him. And that in time he may draw them back, but there's nothing more heartbreaking than to celebrate someone coming to faith only in a few short months or years to see them throw in the towel. And there is a caution for us in this. There is a caution for us in this, is that true disciples of Jesus have a longer-term devotion to him, a longer-term devotion to Jesus. Now, again, my critique of emotion without devotion, I don't mean to say that emotion is a bad thing. Of course not, right? Their immediate response to Jesus is good and God wants us to be passionate worshipers of him. The problem wasn't that they were emotional. The problem was that it was too temporary. That their excitement and love and interest in Jesus disappeared as, as quickly as it appeared. And I really think the problem here is that they had no conviction around who Jesus was. They didn't understand who he really was. And I think it's just an encouragement for us this morning that we again have an opportunity to remember and look to Jesus and remind us our hearts afresh of who it is we're dealing with. Because there won't always be the happy emotions, right? Things will not always go well. Life will not always go in our favor. Things will be hard. Life will be confusing. And yet it's in Hebrews that says we can, even in those moments, have an anchor for your soul when we are convicted of and convinced that Jesus is king. That's our hope when in the tough times, that we are convicted and sure of where our hope is based and put. It's in Jesus. So there's no, not a call to any lesser passion or emotion or, or love. In fact, it's more of a call to a greater level of devotion or what Eugene Peterson calls a long obedience in the same direction. A long obedience in the same direction. We're following Jesus for the long haul. Let's be aware of the correction here with the crowds. A second group of people in this passage is the demons. It says the unclean spirits in the passage, uh, in the version I read. And I think the, the correction here is that, and the challenge here is that they had a lot of clarity so they had a conviction of who Jesus was. They had knowledge, but what they lacked was repentance. It says here in verse 11, 
whenever the unclean spirits saw Jesus, they fell down before him and cried out, you are the son of God. Right, so the demons are making the most accurate statement of who Jesus is in this text. They're seeing him clearly. They have a perfect understanding and knowledge of who Jesus is. But they don't have a saving faith because there is no repentance. Now, I don't mean to say that demons have any kind of opportunity to repent. But like I'm saying, this can represent us in some ways. We can have an accurate understanding of who Jesus is without having genuine faith. We can have a kind of faith that is purely intellectual. Uh, We can have deep, great knowledge and understanding of, of the facts of Jesus, which is crucial. Theology is great. But of course, salvation and forgiveness is about more than just knowing the facts. And so this is why Jesus, when he starts out his ministry, even at the beginning of Mark and in the beginning of every gospel, he says, and he he calls people to repent and believe. That's what Jesus says is the most important thing we can do. If you look at uh, Mark 1 verse 15, this is what Jesus says as he starts his ministry. He says, the time is fulfilled and the kingdom of God is near. So repent and believe the good news. See, Jesus is affirming it's about more than just an accurate knowledge of who Jesus is. It's about knowledge that leads to a response of repentance and faith. We need to go a couple steps further than just recognizing the facts and in fact responding to the facts of who Jesus is in repentance and faith. And so you may ask this morning, well, okay, if I need to repent and believe, what does that look like? And I should just say, this is an ongoing thing. It's what we do when we become Christian, and it's what we do every day as we continue and uh, recommit our lives to Christ as disciples of following him. Jesus, I still need you to be my savior today. I repent, I believe. I repent and I believe. It's, it's the gospel dance, one theologian had uh, called it. He calls it the gospel waltz. Whenever our sin is overwhelming, we repent and we believe. And we remind our hearts who he is. This is what Jesus says. What does this actually look like, though? Uh, theologian Bruce Ware said this, Repentance involves seeing sin for the deceitful and deadly thing that it is, so that we turn from it. Belief in Christ involves seeing Christ for the gracious and powerful Savior that he is, so that we turn to him. These two acts go together in a person's salvation. Repentance and belief are like two sides of the same coin. You can't have one side without having the other side also. So there's a turning from and a turning to. And again, I think the challenge of the demons to us this morning is that we can have an accurate understanding of who Jesus is. And it's one thing to understand. It's another thing to fully place our trust in the saving work of Jesus. We can have a perfect understanding. We have brilliant theology. You can understand the mysteries of God. You can understand the complexities of how the world was created and know the mysteries of when Jesus will return. And God can give you wisdom to proclaim the spiritual excellencies of the 7-1 bomb squad split. You can understand all the brilliant wisdom of God in the world. It's another thing to respond in faith and say, yes, Jesus, I put my life in your hands. I trust in you. I'm trusting you. Without you, I've got nothing. Listen, friends, I just want to say this this morning. When you look at the Gospels and you look who Jesus met with the most grace, who Jesus proclaimed salvation over most frequently, when he, who he dealt with most, uh, most gently, most graciously, with most mercy. It's not those who understood the most. It's those who understood one thing, that they have a problem that only Jesus can fix. And they came to him in faith saying, Jesus, 
You're my only hope. You're my living hope. Would you do it? Because I can't do it. I can't do it. See, salvation is not for the smart. It's for the repentant. And I would just maybe remind us this morning something we already know. A faith that is only intellectual is really just functional unbelief because it hasn't led us to a place of repentance and faith. And so we are still stuck without hope and without forgiveness if that's where we stay. But the opposite is also true. We can run to Jesus and trust him. And maybe a, a, it's a poor illustration, but it's the one I could think of. Is, um, I don't know if there's anyone in the room who is terrified of flying. Scared of flying? Well, we all know someone who is. Maybe you've been on a plane, someone sitting near you that has uh, shrieked at every little t- bit of turbulence. Now, statistically, the facts are it's a minute chance of being in an airplane crash. It's, it's tiny. It's one thing to understand the fact that it's, it's such a small chance. It's another thing to get into the plane relaxed, knowing that the captain's going to get you there safely. You see, you can understand the facts. It's another thing to rest because you know Jesus is going to do the work. And again this morning, can we just rejoice in that together? Jesus is going to do the work. Third group of people, third response, is Jesus' family. I've been so challenged by this this week. What they show us is is familiarity with regards to Jesus, but no worship at this point. And we see it in verses 20 and 21. It says, um, at the end of Jesus' time with the crowds, it says, then Jesus went home and the crowd gathered again so that they were not even able to eat. So many people. When his family heard this, They set out to restrain him because they said he's out of his mind. So Jesus' own family thinks he's crazy. They think he's lost the plot. And I, I, I don't know, but my assumption would be two things. One, because Jesus is seems pretty normal. Because he's fully human, right? He's God, fully God, but he's fully human. He, he cried as a baby. He grazed his knees as a toddler. He worked hard in the family business. He got flu. He, he was fully human. In their eyes, he, he, he was too normal to be God. But also that their eyes were still spiritually blind at this point. And, and God hadn't, hadn't opened their eyes to see Jesus yet at this point. That would come for some of them, right? The book of James in the Bible written by Jesus' brother. He got it. God opened his eyes to see him. But at this point, there is so much familiarity with Jesus that the family had little worship for him. And I think that that can be us. I think just let's be honest together. Maybe you've been a Christian for years and this happens to us. Maybe the gospel doesn't grip your heart like it once did. Maybe forgiveness doesn't give you as much joy as it once did. Maybe God's kindness and mercy towards you doesn't melt your heart like it used to. We can become so familiar with the gospel message sometimes that we actually lose our worship in in some way. There's a sense in which we can become so familiar that the awe and wonder we have in Christ and what he's done for us somehow slips away. Uh, And I would just say, man, this is partly true for our Christian culture and maybe most for unbelievers. This is definitely my testimony. Um, I I grew up in the church, as Lee said, and I I knew all the things. I know know how to wish songs to sing, when to sit, when to stand, how to greet. I could probably pray. Uh, a decent prayer. I only actually got saved in my teenage years, though, and uh, I was still, uh, man, a mess for many years, and still am a mess. But then particularly, what changed is not the external stuff. What changed when I got saved was the internal stuff. Finally, God helped me get grace. It's incredible. It's incredible that our sins can actually be forgiven that you don't have to carry that guilt you're carrying anymore, 
that that shame can be taken away on the basis of Christ carrying it off your shoulders and onto his as he took it to the cross. It's incredible. It's life-changing stuff. It should produce joy. It should produce worship. And I think one of the reasons it doesn't is because we forget too quickly. We forget too quickly. That's one of the key words. That's why one of the key words in the New Testament is remember. Remember. Remember the gospel. We're going to remember the gospel again this morning. And friends, I just want to encourage us with this. I, I don't believe the answer is winding ourselves up or, or um, you know, forcing any kind of emotion. That's, that's not the point. The point is to come back to remembering who Jesus is and what he's done and reflecting on that, sitting in it, swimming in the ocean of who Jesus is and in his grace and kindness towards us until it leads us to a place of renewed thankfulness and gratitude and worship. And I think one of the reasons our culture particularly and maybe you, if you're sitting here this morning and, and maybe you wouldn't call yourself Christian, maybe this is where you're at. Uh, one of the reasons we struggle with this is because we don't see Jesus clearly. He's less of a savior, perhaps, and more of a great guy. And uh, I just wrote this down here because I think it's so helpful. Is a quote C.S. Lewis had uh, wrote in his book, Mere Christianity, when he's talking about how we should see Jesus accurately and where it should lead us. And he just simply says this, I'm trying to prevent anyone saying the really foolish thing that people often say about Jesus, that we're ready to accept Jesus as a great moral teacher, but we don't accept his claim to be God. That is the one thing we must not say. A man who was merely a man and said the sort of things Jesus said would not be a great moral teacher. He would either be a lunatic on the level of a man who says he's a poached egg, or else he would be the devil of hell. Either this man was and is the son of God, or else a madman, or something worse. You can shut him up for a fool, you can spit at him and kill him as a demon, or you can fall at his feet and call him Lord and God. But let us not come with any patronizing nonsense about his being a great human teacher. He has not left that open to us, and he did not intend to. As I said, some of Jesus' own family eventually got there, and they got saved, and they responded in faith and worship. Maybe some of us are there this morning, or maybe it's just a reminder to those of us who've been Christian and are Christian, been Christian for a long time, again, to come to the, back to the heart of worship, and worship our King with fresh hearts of gratitude, of gratefulness and, and thankfulness and, and wonder and awe in what he's done for us. Finally, let's look at the disciples, a fourth group of people in this passage. And what they show us here in verses 13 to 19 is that there is a coming to Jesus in faith without reserve. They're holding nothing back. It's quite amazing, you look at it, Jesus is summoning them up the mountain and calling his 12 disciples that would become apostles to himself, excluding Judas, obviously. One by one, he calls them name by name. And it's quite amazing that even at this moment and toward the end of the Gospels, these guys are still committed and devoted to Jesus. It's a, it's a defining moment in their life where God is changing the trajectory of their whole futures. And they seem to really come to him, leaving a lot behind. They've left their businesses. Some of them left their families. They've, they've given up a lot. But they're coming to Jesus without reserve. They're, they're holding nothing back. They're fully committed to him and giving him all that they are. And just as I was preparing this, I just felt a renewed conviction to assess how much of myself am I actually allowing God to have. I know it sounds like a silly thing to say. I mean, he's God. He owns me. But there's a sense in which you can kind of withhold parts of yourself from him, right? Like this, we draw a line in the sand and there's only so much God could ask of you. Whether you're admitting this consciously and you know about it or it's kind of hidden away, 
we put limits on God and what he can ask of us and how much of us he can really have. Like there's some rooms in our hearts God is not allowed to go in and there's some things he's not allowed to ask us for or some things he can't ask us to do. We, we put limits on his authority in our lives. And the encouragement of the disciples here is that they're coming to Jesus fully, giving, him, giving all that they are to him. And per- perhaps as we just come to a close soon, it's a question I'd love us to think about a bit more. Are there any parts of your life this morning that are off limits to Jesus? Are there any sort of chambers of your heart that, that have restricted access or, or, or any nooks and crannies of, of your soul that, that have the sign, do not enter, beware the dog? Sometimes I think we could, you could respond to Jesus almost feeling like he's trespassing. Oh, Jesus, that's enough now. I've given you enough. I've tithed my 10%. I've come to church, church twice a month. I've done my stuff. I'm surely I'm in your good books by now. I just want to encourage us. These disciples, when they came to Jesus, when they left all those things behind, I, I don't know this for sure, but I'm, I'm pretty sure that they were not feeling burdened and sad. I'm pretty sure that they were feeling amazed and in awe that they were even chosen. And just thankful to be part of Team Jesus. <laughs> See, anything you give up for Jesus, any part of your heart that you surrender to him, any, any area of your life that you allow uh, to, to be given to his sovereignty and authority will never come back to bite you because he's good. And he's working for your good and his glory. If there is any bit of pain or hurt or, or, or just past experiences or, or maybe there's fear of what Jesus might ask you to do if you really surrender to him, listen, It'll be for your joy and his glory to live a fully surrendered life, wholeheartedly saying, Jesus, do what you want. You're, you're, my, you're my king and you're a good king. He'll provide everything we need and empower us and sustain us and help us. It's amazing that we even get chosen at all. Just these disciples, they had no qualifications, they were nothing special. They were mostly uneducated. There was nothing about them that, would, that we would choose. If we saw them, we'd probably think they were losers. <laughs> but you know, Jesus is in the business of picking those who know their life is a mess and turning it around for his glory. And I think we see it in their lives. And if you've been a Christian for any amount of time, I'm sure you've seen the grace of God in your life. It's amazing what God does. Uh, I think John, was it John Newton that famously said, when he gets to heaven, he knows that there's going to be three wonders. First, he'll be surprised that there's, there were some people in heaven that he didn't expect to be there. Secondly, that there will be some people who he thought would be there that aren't be there. And he says, thirdly, the greatest wonder of all, that he'll find himself there. That he'll find himself there. It, it's incredible. It's my encouragement to us this morning just very simply, as we respond to the gospel, as we think about Jesus, as we think about the cross and the, his resurrection, that you know, if there is nothing that Jesus held back to save us, if Jesus really held nothing back to save us, it should and ought to compel us to hold nothing back from serving him. And that we can have a fresh awe in our salvation and gratitude and thankfulness that we can cry out and say, God, thank you for your grace and kindness towards me. And uh, just again, surrender our lives to his grace. So would you pray with me and we'll respond in worship together. Father, thank you for the gift of your grace. Thank you that we know there is absolutely nothing we could have contributed and there is nothing we have contributed. It is all in the blood of Jesus. Thank you, Christ, that your blood is sufficient, that we don't need 
the cross and our good works and efforts to earn anything from you, but Jesus has done the full amount of work to, to secure and to bring us the gift of salvation, that you have purchased us to yourself and we belong to you. We want to say thank you for that, God. We, we just pray as we've been looking at this passage that you would help us respond again this morning in repentance and faith, in worship, in increased devotion, and say, God, you are worth it. You are worth following. We're convinced of the gospel. We're convinced that you died for our sins, that you rose from the dead, that you ascended into heaven, that you are ruling and reigning right now, that you are the hope of the world, that you are worth living for. We confess that together. God, we just pray if there are any in this room this morning who maybe haven't crossed that line of faith. We thank you that you brought them here this morning. And God, we pray that you would continue to open the eyes of their heart to see you. If that is you this morning, I just want to encourage you. God's brought you out this morning because he's, he's seeking you out. Would you respond to him? Father, we just pray uh, for um, an increased gratitude for the gospel among us and what you are doing in this church. Thank you for this community. Thank you that the gospel is coming to bear uh, on the lives of everyone in this place, that you are transforming us from one degree of glory to another, that we are slowly but surely looking more like Jesus. God, we pray for more salvations in this place. God, we pray for more worship in this place, that you would help us as we gather every week in groups and on Sundays, that we would leave rejoicing in the gospel, 